rage in terms of saying we must talk about this subject. And when I was doing these cases, I'm going to tell you, nobody wanted to sit next to me at a dinner party. <laughs> right? No, you know, what do you do? And then well, I'd start they and they'd find some excuse to leave. <laughs> right? Because yeah. it is... Hard. It is it is such a difficult subject. It makes people naturally uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But I will also tell you, when I was selecting juries on these cases, I cannot tell you the number of people who, as prospective jurors, would raise their hand and say, may I speak with the attorneys and the judge in chambers? Mm -hmm. And would talk with us about why they could not sit and listen to that case, and would go on to tell us about how they'd never told anyone but they knew they could not sit and listen to this case, and that's why they mm -hmm. told us. Mm -hmm. And it is an issue that is agnostic in terms of who it affects, socioeconomically, racially, mm -hmm. gender-wise. Mm -hmm. And we really have to deal with it because the pain that the survivors experience is profound, and it is something that we must address both in terms of whatever is possible in terms of prevention, but also in terms of giving survivors a That's, safe place yeah. to go without judgment. Well, um, what, we, what we witnessed uh, was, was a respectful listening to Dr. Yeah. Ford, yeah. Um, but I mean, she was terrified by yeah. her own admission, and I don't know if that was particularly safe as a space. She, she came forward for her civic duty. But I think the Me Too movement has emboldened many because there's power in numbers, and mm -hmm. it, has, it has shown women that, and men that they're not alone. That they're not alone and that they won't be judged. Right? It mm -hmm. is, so when we start talking more about this issue, people will be much more, I think, aware of the fact that it is normal for a survivor to not tell anybody. Mm -hmm. It is normal for a survivor to have some incident that precipitates a reporting years later. It is normal for someone who has experienced a traumatic event to be very precise about certain components uh -huh. of that event yes. and imprecise about others. Yes. And, um, it, and so when we talk more about this, we will understand that, that these things that are now being discussed as, as a reason to question her credibility are actually things that the are symptomatic, that, that are actually mm -hmm. symptomatic mm -hmm. of having had that experience. Mm -hmm. So let's use this as a moment to not only talk about it in the context of the Kavanaugh hearings, mm -hmm. but as a moment to welcome an uncomfortable conversation that must be had if we're going to deal with an issue that is impacting a lot of people. Well, um, earlier today when we had Senator Lindsey Graham here, before he came on the stage, he took a call from President Trump, apparently, and I presume you did not before I you did came not. on the stage. <laughs> However, <laughs> However get that if, call. if you had, if you had, <laughs> what would you have said to President Trump about his, his mocking of that very memory mm -hmm. at uh, his campaign rally last night in Mississippi? Stop being mean. <laughs> Stop being mean. I mean, listen, I'll tell you when I, so the, as everyone knows, the hearings that we had um, where Dr. Ford testified were in the smaller room where we normally meet, as opposed mm -hmm. to the larger room where we had the initial hearings for, doc, for, for Judge Kavanaugh. And so it's, it's a pretty intimate setting. And at the point that she was asked, I'll paraphrase, but I think it was Senator Lay who asked her, what, what, do you remember most? You know, what, what did you carry with you most? And yeah. she talked, it was a very poignant, moving moment. She said, I remember their laughter. Yeah. I remember they were laughing at my experience, laughing at my extent. And she went on to say, I remember they were, that, that he was on top of me. Mm. And I was underneath him. And they were laughing at me. With each other. With each other. And so now we have, last night, the President of the United States at a rally urging a crowd to laugh at her. Yeah. I, I can't think of anything more, not, it, inappropriate is not, it doesn't, no. it's not descriptive it's, enough. It's mean, it's mean, it's and, 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 it's, and, it's, and it is completely without any level of empathy. Mm -hmm. 
about what her experience was. He clearly watched her testimony. So what was the purpose of saying that and doing that? Did it need to be done? Of course not. Mm. But beyond that it didn't need to be done, doing it was for what purpose? It, it, it's, I, can't, it's, I can't understand it. Yeah. And I, um, I'm embarrassed that the President of the United States would do that to this woman. I think it's important to watch some footage of the rallies because some of the, the points that are made during these rallies are, are incredibly painful. Um, the demonization of immigrants has been a go-to theme in the president's rallies, and it, it's devastating to behold understanding the, the founding nature of our country and understanding the replenishment role that immigrants make in our society right. to have them so vilified and, and demonized mm -hmm. for political gain uh, is, is painful at best yep. and uh, destructive. So I wanted to quote this properly, what Senator Graham said, because I think that I'd love to hear your point of view about this. Okay. He said um, in his interview that as far as perjury goes, if we're going to be debating the truthfulness of how Kavanaugh explained the things that were said in his high school yearbook, then God help us. As a fellow prosecutor, however, I assume that the two of you take perjury pretty seriously. Sure. So uh, what do you make of Kavanaugh's characterizations under oath? Well, if, first of all, I think it's um, frankly a, a red herring to, to debate with any seriousness, the fact that high school seniors or college students drink beer. So I think we should just put that aside. Hmm. Like, let's all just agree to put that aside. The point is, the, 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 and the question is, especially on your point about perjury, is this person honest? Yes. Is, uh, and are they honest in a context where they're under oath and testifying before the United States Senate to be confirmed to be a lifelong member of the United States Supreme Court, mm -hmm. which is housed in a building which talks about justice. And one of the most important principles inherent in a system of justice is truth and truthfulness. Right. So that's the context in which I think about the statements made by Judge Kavanaugh mm -hmm. throughout this hearing, both the first time and then in the context of Dr. Ford. And there are stark inconsistencies. Um, and, and that relates to everything in terms of the role he played when he was working for the White House to the, the statements he made about whatever you choose to, to, to talk about in terms of the, the issue and the incident relating to Dr. Ford. And that's the issue that should be before the American public because we are talking about whether or not we have someone who has the ability to be honest and be truthful. The second point has to be a, a conversation about his temperament and thinking about who he is in terms of whether he has the temperament to serve on the United States Supreme Court and do that in a way that will not be influenced by emotion but be influenced by facts. You cannot do that. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move on from this conversation. Thanks. Um, you know, I think I think what's disturbing a lot of people is this lack of decorum and the lack of cooperation among elected officials. And it seems to me progress happens at the speed of trust. And so, how does that? How do you think about rebuilding that trust? Trust is dependent on mutual respect yeah. and cooperation and actually getting to know people. Yeah. And when we had uh, Senators Coons and Flake mm -hmm. here yesterday, they were talking about having taken trips together and having shared a lot of moments outside of the Senate in order to really understand each other's values. Um, how is that happening now in the Senate? And how do you think you can build trust with other right. senators? Um, 
I think that there's no question that um, these relationships are very important and the building block of a relationship of trust, again, is we speak truth and we allow others to speak their truth and be respectful of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I can think of a, a couple of um, issues that I'm actually working with my Republican colleagues on where I think that fundamentally what brought us together was mm -hmm. a shared truth. So, for example, I'm working with James Lankford, the senator from Oklahoma, uh -huh. on a bill to be better secure our election systems, and so it's focused on state election systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, Thank you. can you take a minute and talk a little bit about that? Sure. Because I would love... I would love to hear from you about the state of our electoral process and yeah. how safe our information, yeah. our, our media, both real and synthetic, yeah. are, yeah. Um, our emails are, mm -hmm. our voting machines are, and how confident yeah. are you around the midterms and yeah. whether or not we will have an unhacked election? I'm concerned. I am concerned, and in fact, um, J James Lankford and I served together on the Senate Intelligence Committee and Senate Homeland Security Committee. We're actually the only two who served together on both. Mm. And so we have received a lot of the same information, which has given us obviously um, equally a sense of concern yeah. about whether the state's systems, each of the state systems is up to par in terms of having state-of-the-art technology that would, um, at the very least, um, mitigate whatever tampering efforts may, may occur in terms of those systems. And, and I have real concerns, and so our bill, what it would do if it ever got to the floor for a vote, um, is it would, it, what we have focused on is bringing resources to the states, and in particular those states that don't otherwise have natural resources, uh, financial resources uh -huh. to upgrade their systems. Yeah. We would require regular audits. Right? So it's just like any system. There is, uh, without getting into the weeds, but there is a mechanism for auditing, from, for randomly checking to make sure that all of the systems are in place and that they've not been tampered with. But ultimately, it is also about creating an incentive that we go back to paper ballots. Who would have thought that? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes. Right. Right. So how, know, long, how long because, does the audit take? How that? long does the audit take? Is it ongoing? It would be ongoing. And in each, there are some best practices. Mm -hmm. Um, but there would also be, for example, just randomly testing um, the system to, to figure out, based on what we know, how people voted in terms of any kind of exit polls, figuring out if what actually happened is, is consistent right. with that. So it's, again, it's about acknowledging that our system needs work, it needs improvement. But I will tell you honestly also, when I talk about this publicly, the tension in talking about it is that, yes, I, I do believe we need to be concerned and, and then channel that concern around upgrading systems. But the concern I have when I talk about it is I don't want people to then believe that if they vote, it won't matter. Right. And that's the tension with this topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so we have to kind of be able to have two conversations at once, which yes. is your vote counts, get out and vote, and certainly don't get, you know, and then obviously deal with voter suppression tactics, which is another point. Um, and then also say, yes, I'm going to vote, but I also yes. want to know that these systems are upgraded. So yes. that's one example. Another, in terms of the bipartisan effort, I'm working with Rand Paul. We have a bill that is focused on reforming the money bail system in the United States. And uh, because that's, it's critically important, and, and the short version of that is that essentially what happens is same person, two people similarly situated charged with the same crime uh, waiting for trial. They are told about their bail by a judge based on some random bail yeah. schedule. And the person who has the money in their back pocket, $20,000 is the average bail in the United States, they get out. The person who doesn't have $20,000 in their back pocket sits in jail for what could be weeks, months, even potentially years, simply because they don't have the money. So we have a de facto debtor's prison. Exactly. And that's exactly right. It's not only a criminal justice issue, it's an economic justice issue. So this bill, and it's been great working with him. In fact, soon after we, we dropped it, we... Um, we talked about it, and, and I checked in with him, you know, Ran, how are you people doing? You working with me? Is it y'all good, you know? And, um, <laughs> and he said, Kamala, Appalachia loves it. <laughs> right? Good. And that's the, the point being, and it gets back to the point of your question, I think. It's about the truths and speaking truths and joining in truths. And it's also about appreciating that the vast majority of us have so much more in common than what separates us. 
And, you know, I reject this notion that we are divided by our nature or by our existence. I, there are certainly powerful forces that are trying to sow hate and division among us. But when we step back and think about it, you know, based on that thought that wakes us up in the middle of the night, when we wake up with that thought, sometimes in a cold sweat, we are never thinking that thought through the lens of the party with which we're registered to vote. We are never thinking that thought through the lens of some demographic upholster put us in. And when we wake up thinking that thought, for the vast majority of Americans, it has mm -hmm. to do with one of just a very few things. Family. Our personal health, the health of our children, our parents. Mm -hmm. For so many, can I get a job, keep a job, pay the bills, you know, retire with dignity, pay off student loans? And to the extent that we all hold on to that truth, mm -hmm. It may be an unpopular truth to speak at this moment, but it is certainly a truth. If we hold on to that truth, I think we'll yeah. be in a better place. Um, I'm, I'm regretting that we have to wrap up, but I think oh. what you're telling us is it's clear if we want to change the narrative, we have to change the narrator. Um, so thank you for coming. <laughs>